Based on the current outlook, it appears that inflation may moderate in the coming quarters. The Reserve Bank of India may be approaching the end of its rate hike cycle with perhaps one or two more rate hikes. Investors in debt mutual funds should select a fund based primarily on their investment horizon instead of being invest influenced overly by the external macro environment. These were some of the views shared with us by Mr. Joydeep Singh, corporate trainer on debt markets and author of four books on subjects ranging from mutual fund investing to fixed income investing, wealth management and financial planning. Do watch this interview to learn more about the outlook on interest rates and how to go about constructing a debt mutual fund portfolio in the current environment. Good morning, Mr. Sen, and welcome to our show. Good morning, Sanjay. How are you? Very good. Our goal for this interview will be to give our viewers a sense of the key takeaways for, for the monetary policy review on September 30th. And then we'll talk about how debt mutual fund investors should go about investing in the present scenario. My first question to you is, what was the sense that you got on the inflation front? Can we expect any relief there anytime soon? Yes, the answer is yes. Now, uh, before I come to the numbers as to what are the expected inflation numbers, let me first tell you how inflation is measured because that is important, that is uh, critical. And here, uh, clarity will help people understand how inflation is calculated and how to form a perspective on it. So firstly, inflation is measured year on year. It may sound simple, but uh, it has a very big significance. How is it measured? There is an inflation index. So we follow CPI, consumer price inflation. So for a particular month, let us say for the month of August 22. For the month of August 22, there is an inflation index that is compared with August 21. So uh, index this month, this year, index corresponding month, previous year. And that is compared and see to what extent it has gone up. Has it gone up by 5%, by 7%, by 8%? And that is the headline inflation number we get. So what does it mean? There are broadly two sets of factors which influence or decide or impact this inflation. One is the price level this year. As an example, August 22. What are the price levels now in August 22? And also, what were the price levels last year, which is August 21? Now, people focus on the price levels now, that is August 22. But you know, uh, simple common sense will tell you, in this calculation, price levels in August 21 has as much of a significance. So what it simply means is, if price levels last year were high, inflation this year is expected to be lower, even if prices are high, and vice versa. If last year inflation was low, even if this year prices are not as high, even then uh, inflation as a number, as a headline number, would seem to be high. That is how inflation is measured. Whether it is desirable or not, scientific or not, we can debate, but that's a different debate. Now coming to your question uh, on the expectation of inflation coming down. Let us look at the numbers given by RBI itself. RBI estimate is for the quarter July, September this year, it is 7.1%. For the quarter October, December this year, the estimate is 6.5%. And for the quarter Jan, March 23, estimate is 5.8%. So as you see, it is gradually coming down. 7.1 July, September, 6.5 October, December, 5.8 Jan March and for the next quarter, which is Q1 of next year, which is April, May, June 23, the expectation is 5%, which means gradually it is coming down. So how is it coming down? So as I said, two sets of factors, uh, price levels now and price levels previous year. So price levels now, even though psychologically, it seems prices are high, crude oil, fertilizer, metals, prices are high. Yes, they are high as per historical standards. But the point is, they are off the peak. What was the peak? The peak was touched this year after the war broke out. War broke out in February this year. So sometime around uh, March, April, May, depending on the particular commodity we are discussing, price levels peaked. And from those peak of say March or April this year, now like August, September, October, price levels, well, generally high, but they have peaked. 
and it is expected that prices will ease uh, gradually going ahead. Just to uh, give you an example, crude oil, it's a very significant thing for us in India. The peak was $120 per barrel sometime in uh, March or April. Now it is significantly less than 100. And for these projections, like I told you, RBI estimate of so much. Previous policy review, RBI estimate was $100, $405 per barrel. This time, the projection is 100 per barrel. It has come down. And today, as we see, it's like around $90 per barrel. So that way, prices are coming down. And secondly, as I said, the base effect, price levels corresponding month previous year. Just to give an example, this year, April, April 22, inflation was 7.79%, which was obviously high. Now, previous year, April 21, inflation was high. So what it means is this year, in spite of a supportive, favorable base, inflation was high, which means the base effect is that much supportive, that much favorable for April 23. So like I said, uh, April 2023, RBI call is 5%. The base effect is that much favorable. So with the favorable base effect and generally price levels coming down, yes, inflation will ease. Next point. Uh, what is the composition basket, measurement basket for measurement of uh, inflation? We think of crude oil and all those things, but actually almost half the basket is food items, food, beverages, food related uh, items, almost half the CPI consumption basket. So there, well, um, currently some vegetable prices, food prices are on the high side, but generally if you look at it, this year monsoon has been in surplus. Reservoir levels are good as per historical standards. Crop plantation has been little low than previous year, but it is not bad as such. So as and when we get a positive contribution from these aspects, like uh, positive rainfall, positive monsoon, positive water reservoir level, and as and when the supply comes in, gradually inflation is expected to ease, which, which means RBI will hike rates. As of today, inflation last declared number is 7%. RBI for it, even after the hike is 5.9%. So it was 5.4, now it is 5.9, which means still there is a gap. But if we take a forward looking view, okay, today it is 7%, but forward looking view, one year ahead, only even less than one year, it's 5%. So that way things are improving. So I think RBI will hike rates further from 5.99 to whatever, six quarter or thereabouts, uh, they will hike. And gradually we look at real positive uh, interest rates, even on an overnight basis. So overnight basis means this RBI repo rate. This is the rate for one day lending. RBI lending for one day to uh, banks. So even on an overnight basis over a period of time, we are looking at positive real interest rates. Now, there have been many reports in the media that inflation is not as big a problem in, in India as it is in the developed world. But because the US Fed has been hiking is, such an, is on such an aggressive rate hiking path, the Indian Central Bank will also have to follow suit. Uh, could you explain what this means for our viewers? Okay, so I'll tell you in two parts, uh, what it means and then uh, my view. So what it means is the conventional theory, the conventional perception says that uh, foreign investments will come to India when there is a positive interest rate differential. So in India, interest rate is so much, inflation is so much, and net differential is so much. And in their country, um, inflation so much, interest rate so much, so much is the real interest, positive interest rate. So higher the differential, the better. Or even if we ignore inflation for a moment, <coughs> the um, interest rates as such, the higher in India, the better, because that is supposed to attract foreign money, at least as per uh, theory. So as of today, we have our repo rate at 5.9%. Uh, uh, the US Fed rate is uh, three quarter, three half. After the latest hike, it will go up further. So people are saying that uh, the gap is not as much as earlier, which is factually correct. Earlier, if you look at the history of this differential, this spread or gap, the gap was higher. Now it is relatively narrower. That is what this theory means. Now I come to my view. I have a different view on this. Uh, it may sound like stating the obvious, but RBI, what does RBI stand for? I stands for India. It may sound like whatever, stating the obvious. But the point I'm trying to make is, Reserve Bank of India has a mandate from the people of India, from the Parliament of India. What is the mandate? Firstly, price stability, which basically means controlling inflation. 
and uh, secondly, supporting growth, which means whatever is happening in India, Indian fundamentals, Indian inflation, Indian growth, or other relevant aspects, that is to be considered by the RBI or the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee. Now, in the entire decision-making process, the discussion, the deliberations in the committee, the committee has a three-day meeting. The third day, we have the uh, announcements. Uh, currency rate, currency volatility, what's happening in, across the globe, US Fed rate or other, these are relevant aspects. These are discussed, but the final decision is not based on that. Because as I said, RBI is Reserve Bank of India. So our fundamentals are the pivot, the criteria based on which the decision is taken. Just to give you an analogy as to what is the relevance or non-relevance of this aspect, US Fed rate hikes, and uh, this is where um, I have a different opinion from other experts. To give you the analogy of cricket, because we all follow cricket, it is like saying the pitch, the pitch is fast or slow, is relevant. Of course, it is relevant. Let's say for the sake of uh, discussion, the batter is batting on a slow pitch, which means the batter will move his bat at a relatively slower pace on a slow pitch. But what is of bigger significance is whether the batter is facing a fast bowler or a spin bowler. Just to give an analogy, let us say a fast bowler usually bowls at say 140 km per hour. If the pitch is slow, it will come at say 130 km per hour. A spin bowler bowls at say 90 km per hour or 80 km per hour. Now, if the batter says, oh, the pitch is slow, doesn't matter, he is a fast bowler. I will uh, move the bat so slowly as if I'm facing a spin ball, 90 km per hour. You got the sense. Yes. So it is like saying, is the pitch relevant? Of course, the pitch is relevant. The batter's estimate is key, the ball is coming at 140 or 130 km per hour. But can the batter ignore the, the bowler? Is he a fast bowler or is he a spin bowler? That is of bigger significance. So the analogy is for RBI, what's happening in India, Indian fundamentals, inflation, growth, <clears throat> That is what they're facing. The pitch, as in what's happening globally, what the US Fed is doing or other central banks are doing. Yes, of course it is relevant, but only so much. The batter cannot base his decision on the pitch only. It's about the bowler. Similarly for RBI, it is what's happening in India. So I'll give you one more example. Um, if you go back to 2013, and you will recall that the rupee was depreciating significantly. And the RBI took a measure in July 2013. RBI did significant rate hike and the RBI did significant liquidity squeeze. So our yield levels went up significantly. The expectation was we have increased our rates, we have increased our interest rate. So our bonds, government bonds are available cheaper, they will come into buy. Did they come into buy? No, they did not. The reason simply is the reason why they were exiting India was entirely different. So unless you understand that, the measure you take is not going to be effective. That is my point. Uh, whatever is happening globally is only one of the aspects, not the basic criteria. And um, just to draw uh, this thing from yesterday. Yesterday, the governor clarified that uh, he distinguished, rightly so, between RBI and MPC. What is the distinction? The MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, decides interest rates and that's all. Currency, forex reserves that come broadly under the domain of RBI, but not MPC, which means the RBI will base decisions on inflation and growth, not uh, decide on currency or uh, forex reserves. So hope that clarifies. Yes. So in the current rate cycle, the repo rate has gone up by 190 basis points. How many more rate hikes do you expect? And of what magnitude? Some estimate, of course, it is yeah, very sure. hard. No, no, of what course, is your um, best guess. Yeah, my best guess is if we talk of the immediate term, the next meeting is scheduled for seventh of December, seventh December twenty two. So my best guess is on seventh of December, the RBI will hike by twenty five or thirty five basis points. So five ninety deposit will go up to say six fifteen or six quarter. Thereafter, the next meeting is in February. Whether in February they will hike or not, hike by how much. So that is an open-ended thing. So my sense is key, uh, depending on how inflation pans out, they will take their decision. So here the point I will make is, in the market, some experts are saying the terminal report, as in after the rate hike cycle, the terminal report. 
Some people are saying it will go up to 650, 675, 7. My view is not that. It will not be as high. The reason is the RBI governor has said on record that growth sacrifice should be within manageable limits. Now, what is the meaning of within manageable limits? It means the higher the interest rate, it is impacting growth to that extent. So in the process, in the efforts to contain inflation while rates have to be high, that should not be out of proportion, which means the terminal repo rate would not be as much as to harm our growth. And that is a very rightful uh, practical thinking from the RBI, which is why my sense is it will not go up to as much as uh, 6, half, 6, 7.5, uh, 7%. And just to uh, go back to the inflation numbers we discussed, if the RBI projection is 5.8 in Jan, March, 5% in April, June. Anyways, expectation is inflation will come, come down. So if the uh, report is say six quarter as an example, and inflation comes within uh, 6%, we have a positive real rate even on overnight basis. So uh, that is my expectation at this point. So for debt mutual fund investors, especially new investors entering the markets now, what would your advice be? How should they go about constructing their debt mutual fund portfolio? Sure. So the first point is, the first and foremost point, irrespective of timing and irrespective of what is uh, happening in the market, the decision on the portfolio construct, the fixed income part of your portfolio, your uh, debt mutual funds, the criteria is not so much about what's happening in the market. That comes later. So firstly, your basic objectives, what is your uh, investment objective, what is your investment horizon, what is your risk appetite, that is the first and foremost criteria. Even within that, the difference between debt funds and equity funds is that in debt funds, you have a graded structure. Your horizon is so much, you have this fund. Your horizon is so much, you have this fund. Starting with uh, liquid funds as the base, you have ultra short money market, then short duration, banking PSU, corporate bond, and then so on and so forth. So for a horizon like cash equivalent, uh, something comparable to bank deposits, uh, you have liquid funds for a three month horizon, six month horizon, you have uh, ultra short, you have low duration, you have money market. For horizon of two years, three years, you have short duration fund, you have a banking phase fund, you have corporate bond fund and uh, so on. That is the first and foremost criteria. Now coming to your question, uh, what's happening currently? So what's happening currently, not just now, but at any point of time, that has only so much significance in your portfolio construct, and that you may use for fine-tuning your portfolio allocation. So as an example, uh, if RBI rates are high and the expectation is that inflation will come down, not now, I'm saying sometime later, inflation is, uh, is expected to come down. At that point of time, you may build in a little bit of long duration in your portfolio. If the expectation is um, RBI will hike rates and inflation will go up and all those things, you make your portfolio a little conservative. Conservative meaning the portfolio maturity of your fund should be relatively lower, not like on the higher side. So lower the portfolio maturity, lower the portfolio duration, the better it is. And higher, it is that much risky. You will benefit only if interest rates uh, come down. So that you may use for fine tuning. So as of now, the view is the RBI is mostly done. Like you said, it has gone up by 190 basis point. So from 590, they will go up to whatever, six quarter or whatever uh, RBI decides. But one thing is for sure, you, we are towards the end of the rate hike cycle. After 190 basis point hike, for the whatever, 25 basis, 50 basis, whatever. We are towards the end of the cycle. It is mostly priced in. So uh, after the last RBI rate hike, rates will pause for maybe whatever, one year or something. And after one, two, three years, uh, depending on where inflation pans out, RBI may look at uh, rate cuts. So sometime uh, in future. So what would be a good time for entering long duration funds? So for entering long duration funds, I'll give you two different perspectives. One is if you have a very long horizon. Now, what is a long horizon? As an example, if you're entering a GSEC fund, a guild fund, with a portfolio maturity of say, 10 years as an example. If you have a horizon of 10 years, you are safe. You don't really have to look at what's happening in the market, what is the expectation and so on and so forth. You can simply uh, shut your eyes and invest with a horizon of 10 years. Now, if your horizon is not 10 years, if it is like whatever, three years, four years, five years, and you have to look at what's happening in the market, how your LRV is going up or down, to what extent it is moving, and all those things, uh, short to medium tenure horizon movements are relevant for you. So then you look at 
uh, what is the prevailing inflation rate or uh, what is the prevailing RBI repo rate and what is the expectation? Is it that it's expected to come down, RBI expected to cut rates and all those things. So when you have that sort of view, inflation expected to ease, RBI expected to cut, at that point of time, uh, you may look at a, a exposure in long bond funds basically to play that view that uh, RBI will cut rates. And that is when you can uh, come into long duration fund with not so much of a long horizon at your discretion. Currently, a lot of uh, target maturity funds are being launched. So what are the pros and cons of these funds? Oh, there are lots of uh, pros in target maturity funds. So firstly, you have a very high visibility of returns. Now, what is this visibility of returns? When you put money in a bank, deposit it is clear. I'm putting a deposit at say 6% rate or 7% rate, whatever be the rate, it is very clear. In a mutual fund, a mutual fund being a, a market-oriented product or a market-linked product, you don't really have a bank FD kind of visibility. So the proxy we use there is the portfolio YTM. YTM is yield to maturity, which is the weighted average yield of all the instruments in the portfolio. That data is given by the mutual funds in their fact sheet. We look at the YTM, we look at the expenses, and net of expenses YTM gives us a ballpark figure. So if the net of expenses YTM is say 5.5% or 6%, we may expect 5.5% or 6% over an appropriate holding period. That is the uh, nearest proxy. Now in an open-ended fund, uh, you can never really hold the fund manager responsible for delivering the net of expenses YT because the market is like dynamic, market moves every day. Whereas in a target maturity fund, whatever is net of expenses YTM, there is a very high degree of visibility. So today in a, a target maturity fund, if the net YTM is say 6% or 7%, there is a very high degree of chance that over an adequate holding period, if you hold till maturity, you will actually get that 6% or 7%. Open-ended fund, yes, you will get more or less around that. But uh, in a target maturity fund, you have a higher degree of visibility of getting that 6% or 7%. That's the first point. Uh, first pro for investing in target maturity funds. Secondly, these are portfolio maturity rolled down. Rolled down means there being a defined maturity date, like three years, five years, 10 years, 14 years. With every passing day and with every passing year, the remaining maturity comes down. Hence, the remaining duration also comes down. Now, what does that mean? With the remaining maturity and the remaining duration coming down, the market-related volatility also comes down. Let's give an example. It's a five-year target maturity fund. So it's a five-year maturity fund. Duration is, say, four years. So your volatility is four times what's happening in the market. After one year, the maturity is four years. Duration is, say, 3.5, as an example. Multiplier of volatility is 3.5. After three years, maturity is two years, multiplied is say 1.8 or something. So the residual volatility also is coming down gradually, which means if you can hold till maturity good, even if you hold till maturity as such, but for an adequate long horizon, your volatility also is coming down, which means you are that much safer, which is not the case with the usual open-ended funds. So we discussed the visibility of returns, we discussed portfolio maturity rolled out, which means gradually reducing volatility as per the uh, market move. Thirdly, portfolio quality is very good. We have uh, GSEX, government securities, they have SDL. So SDL stands for state development loans, which also are government securities, issued by the state governments, which also are safe. And we have AAA rated PSU bonds. So the portfolio of these uh, target maturity funds uh, comprise a very blue chip kind of this thing like GSEC as such, SDL, state uh, government uh, security, or triple rated uh, PSU. Next point, the expense ratio is very low. As against the, the usual funds, the expense ratio being low, uh, there is less of uh, income in this for the mutual fund distributor, and it is more for the uh, investor. So it is that much better for the uh, investor and liquidity. So the comparable product for target majority funds is FMPs. Now, earlier days, FMPs were popular. Now, FMPs are fading away, and uh, FMPs are being replaced by target maturity funds. So, what was the issue with FMPs? Two issues. One is the maturity used to be approximately three years. So, your choice was limited. You had a three year or maybe around three year kind of maturity product and liquidity. 
SMPs for the sake of regulation were listed at the exchange, but liquidity was or is very poor. You can't really sell before maturity if you want to. Target maturity funds, you have liquidity. And how do you have that liquidity? There are two formats for target maturity funds. One is the index fund format, where you can simply buy and sell with the AMC, like purchase redemption, the way usual way it happens. Or it is the ETF format. So ETFs obviously are traded at the exchange. The AMC appoints market makers. So in target maturity funds, you have liquidity also in case you require uh, money prior to maturity. So lots of pros, which is why uh, target maturity funds are gaining popularity. And there are so many options. You have three-year maturity, you have five-year maturity, 10-year maturity, 14-year maturity. You do your <coughs> matching with your cash flow. You look at the money after three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, accordingly you match and you select an appropriate maturity, target maturity fund. So it's becoming very popular nowadays. Very true. And one question on credit risk funds. Uh, would you say it is advisable in the current environment for retail investors to bet on credit risk funds? Yeah, that's a very <clears throat> relevant question. I'll answer it in two parts. One is the uh, fundamental aspect and the other is the uh, practical aspect. The fundamental aspect is no issues. Whatever happened, whatever defaults happened uh, earlier, like uh, all these defaults, ILFS September 2018, DHFL uh, February and onwards, and so many other corporates uh, defaulted. It uh, culminated with the Yes Bank 81 right on it, uh, February, March 2020. That default cycle is over. Just imagine uh, in a lockdown phase, when the economy was slowing down, even then, we did not hear of any fresh major default. Today, corporates are doing very well. They have deleveraged, balance sheets have uh, improved, so things are that much better. So no concern on that front. That is the fundamental aspect. And we'll come to the practical aspect. The practical aspect is usually the expense ratio in credit risk funds is on the higher side. So what you do is you look at the uh, YTM of the portfolio. Uh, portfolio YTM of a credit risk fund is so much. Look at the expense ratio. So what is the net, what we call the net running yield? So as an example, if the uh, YTM is say 8% as an example, if the expense is say 1.5%, what is the net running yield? It is 6.5%. You compare that uh, with a, a usual uh, good quality fund. So as an example, if the portfolio uh, yield of a good quality fund is say 7% as an example, and expense is say 0.5%. Uh, so uh, you get like 6.5%. So what you have to do is you compare the net running yield of a credit risk fund with that of a good quality fund. So as an example, if the net running yield of a credit risk fund is higher than that of a good quality, say, corporate bond fund or banking PSA fund by, say, 20 or 30 basis points, it's not worth it. Why should we take that uh, credit yield, even though the scenario has improved from earlier, only for a alpha, alpha is in the higher returns, only for an expected alpha of 20 or 30 basis points. If the alpha is 1%, or if not 1%, at least, say, 90 basis point, 80 basis point, 70 basis point, it makes sense that I'm taking that credit risk for an expectation of additional 70, 80, 90 basis points. So why go for 20 basis points only? That is the uh, practical aspect to uh, look at uh, this fund as a well. I have come to the end of my questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Sen. It was a pleasure speaking to you as always. And I'm sure our viewers will also gain immensely from this interaction. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Sanjay.